I think it's time. Let's start this talk. Before we start this talk, before we even tell you who we are and why we're here, uh, let's do a poll. So who in here is an Android developer? I count three. All right. Uh, how about Kotlin developers? All right. All right. Getting up there a little bit more. How about cloud developers? Uh, sort of half-ish, maybe. Um, and what else were we? Favorite color, purple? Uh, <laughs> Anything else? Oh, machine learning stuff. Who's playing around with ML stuff? And probably the same Android developers. That was three. All right. <laughs> cool. Um, you will not need any of those. Uh, I was just sort of curious what people's background was on all of this. Welcome to... Kotlin Molis. <laughs> like that look he gave me. Like, Does, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we, which session are we in? Uh, does everyone know what a mullet is? The hairstyle, you know, what? like business in the front looks really clean, but then a party in the back, nice and long. So that's a mullet, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is hairstyles. <laughs> the idea behind this talk was to take a look at a project, uh, one single project, and we'll see how this works, um, that was all Kotlin, all places, doing both uh, server-side development as well as client or Android development. Uh, and then what can we do on both sides? How do we share information back and forth? How do you build a project? Um, and then how do you do interesting things while you're at it? So should we say who we are? Oh, sure. I'm sure everyone knows who you are. <laughs> so I'm James Ward. I'm a developer advocate on Google Cloud. And I'm Chet Haas. And the slide says I'm also a developer advocate, but on the Android team. So let's do this thing. All right. Let's take a look at a quick demo. I'm going to pop out to the Android emulator and show you this. Uh... Black screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know... I'm going to go ahead and restart this thing. I'm not sure what's going on there. There we go. There we go. That is awesome. That looks, that looks better. All right. So let's clear this thing. So this is the amazing UI that I built. Uh, James helped. And uh, it's really beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> you needed help on that. So yes. something really simple is going on here. What we're going to do for at least this part of the demo is restart the application in the emulator. And we're going to draw a simple shape in here. So I just want to. Uh, and <laughs> and half, later that's is, an arc. That's a wonderful arc. <sighs> having issues. Beta tools, am I right? Uh, all right, let's try that again. We're Ooh, gonna draw a shape in here. Circle. I'm such a happy person. I'm gonna draw a little <laughs> smiley face in there. All right, so this is where we're gonna begin. We're gonna do hopefully more interesting things from here, but I just wanted to motivate some of the code that we're gonna look at now. I'm gonna show how you do this kind of stuff in Android, and then we'll sort of move into server-side and ML stuff from there. But basically taking a shape, and then where we're gonna take it during the talk is, what can we do with that shape? What can we infer about what the user has drawn? Uh, and then how do we share information back and forth? But let's start with the basics. So we'll go back to slides here and say, OK, so when the user draws on the screen, this is the emulator I was using a mouse, but you could have this on your phone. And we do. And you draw with your finger. So you need to track the motion events, right? So there's APIs for tracking the motion events. And then given the, the move, you know, up, down, and move events on the phone, then you can take that information. You need to add locations to this path, this geometry object. You can invalidate, which tells Android, OK, this view needs to be redrawn now. And then the, draw, the view is going to be redrawn with the new path data, with all of the path data. And then you're ready to analyze. We'll get to the analysis later. But this is just all the basic sort of geometry and drawing stuff that's going on. So the overall app looks like this. Is that XML? It is it's, XML. You uh, should have done it in YAML. Can you do YAML? Um, you know, device? I could have, except for the part where Android needs XML. Uh, all right, so this is the UI. Not anything terribly interesting going on in there. The text views that it talks about there, you can't see them, because that's where we're going to post the information about the, the inference and confidence values that we have on, on what we detected. Um, the more interesting part is this drawing canvas. Uh, this object down there at the bottom, that is the custom view that we've created to actually receive all the drawing stuff. And that looks like this. Um, not terribly interesting, uh, but it is a custom view. All the rest of this information, basically information to tell it where to live in the, in the layout uh, and how large to be. 
Uh, let's take a look at the code. Uh, it is a custom view, so we have this class, has a couple of fields for setting up the paint object that we're going to use for actually drawing the input from the user, as well as this path object that we're going to stuff all the points, you know, the move and the line information as the user uh, moves their finger around, and then some methods. So we're going to need to be able to get a bitmap for this inference that we're going to do later on, or set a bitmap if it's come down from the server. Uh, we need to actually track the touch events, which we'll get to in a minute. Occasionally, we need to clear the can and then we have this on draw, which for custom views is the way it handles uh, the part where, okay, it's been invalidated, now it needs to actually draw stuff onto the screen. So on touch event, you basically need to track three things. You need to know when that finger goes down, when the finger moves around, and when the finger is up. And that's the end of the drawing commands. For each one of those, we basically issue a move uh, event in the path that basically says, okay, you've got the path object, I want you to move to a place in space, and then we're going to do line two, line two, line two until they pick up their finger, and then you're done with that segment. It could be a multi-segment path, um, very flexible, and then How you handle the How does the eyes work, though? Because it's not a line. It's, it's not a dot. line, which is why I added this special logic there. So as soon as you put your finger down, it actually adds a line from and to the same point, which just adds a nice thick stroke point uh, where it's at. We invalidate, which is Android's way of saying something has changed in this view. You need to redraw yourself. And then the drawing command looks like this. Uh, this is the drawing method on draw. It says, OK, given the canvas, uh, go ahead and draw the path. And that's all of those move to line to operations that we added. Uh, along the way. All right, so now that we have the shape, wouldn't it be nice if we could do something more interesting than just look at it? So let's talk about machine learning. So the overall way that this thing works is you have a bunch of data out there. They may be you know, drawings, hand drawings um, with labels associated with them. It may be pictures of cats. It probably is pictures of cats. That's it's just the internet what is we for train cats. On. Yes, it is. Uh, they have finally taken over. You send that into uh, an engine like TensorFlow. You say, okay, here's a whole bunch of images and information about them. You send it into this uh, machine learning engine. So then TensorFlow can create a model out of it. So it's sort of encapsulated it into this you know, database of information about all these images and what they represent. Uh, and uh, then we can, for our purposes, we're going to create what's called a, a TensorFlow Lite model. And this is something that can then be shipped down to the device so that you can run. It's kind of like the Bud Light model, you know? I hope it's better. Yeah. I really do. Uh, then you can do on device um, inference so you don't have to do everything out on the cloud if you have this lighter weight model that you can run on device. Uh, and then given user data, so see that arrow is going the other direction here. So the user then inputs information like that beautiful smiley face that I drew. And you send that in and you compare that with the model that you produced earlier. And then you create these inferences and you get these results. And the results are basically, uh, well, I, I'm going to show you here. There's different kind of results that you can get. We're going to uh, get labels for now. So we're basically going to say, what is this thing? And we get these strings back. Uh, you can get information like barcodes. So these are like different APIs and approaches. Um, and you can provide different models for doing all of these things. You can do text detection. You can detect objects useful in videos. You can say, you know, what are the distinct objects in this video as these things are moving around? You can do face detection. And you can do text translation as well. So again, APIs and, and, uh, and um, APIs and approaches exist for all of these things. And you get back all of this, plus, very importantly, confidence values, right? It doesn't just say, this is a cat. It says, I think this is a cat, maybe 98% sure. And the, here are some other things uh, that it might be instead. And we'll see this um, as we get into more demos later. OK, so another approach, instead of like doing all of this every time that you want to do ML, is you could just build, use built-in models. And that's what we're going to be doing um, for the most part today. It turns out that TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, MLKit, they come with a lot of built-in trained data already. And you can use that in some cases to do uh, detection for some common things. Just let somebody else deal with all that stuff. Yeah, that is my approach to basically life. <laughs> all right. So we're going to get some image labels. I would love it if I could draw this thing on the screen and then ask uh, MLKit what I just drew. 
uh, because maybe I don't know because my drawing is that bad. So the first step is we extract a bitmap, right? So we knew we knew how to draw on the screen, but now we can ask uh, Android and the Canvas object to actually get a bitmap for us. Then we create the object that we're going to need for the APIs, the Firebase Vision image, and then we can create a labeler. This is the API to say, okay, given a model, I want you to take the user data and compare these things and give me results. So I call that API, I process the data, and then I sit there and wait in a callback until I get back the results, hopefully successful results, and then we populate the UI with the information. Do we wait? We wait very patiently because it's so exciting, this ML This stuff. is async, right? Uh, it's async, and async is hard. Oh, I see oh. what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we go do something else, and the UI is responsive, and then eventually we get a callback later. Yeah, good yeah. point. All right. No waiting. No, no waiting. No waiting. Uh, all right, so to get the bitmap data, um, APIs on Android basically create a bitmap of the size that we want. Uh, so we're creating this, you know, maybe in the size of the canvas itself or of the, the data models that we're using, whatever. Um, then we get a reference to the canvas for that bitmap. This is basically saying, I want to be able to draw into this bitmap, and then I'm going to take all that information from my custom view, and instead of drawing it to the screen, I'm just going to draw it to the bitmap. So it's basically a, a different version of exactly what we're seeing on the screen. Uh, we return the bitmap, um, and then we create the Firebase Vision image that I talked about. We're going to create it uh, from the bitmap itself. So this is the user data. Uh, and then we're going to use this ABI called On Device Image Labeler. So this is saying I want to do local ML detection uh, on the device with the built-in models. And then we're going to process the image. This is the thing that actually runs the inference. And then you add a success listener, and this is the callback. Uh, so eventually the code inside of there is called and we basically get a data structure which is going to be a list of lists and each of those items contains the information that you're looking for. There's some label associated with it as well as a floating point value which represents the percentage uh, confidence value. Does anybody see the bug on that slide in that code? Vars. We don't need vars. There should be vowels. <laughs> Immutable. Uh, I was testing them. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to process the results, um, and this basically says, okay, for each one of the results, we get back a varying number of results. You'll see in the demo, sometimes it has no idea what I drew, especially with the more, more limited model that it has on the local device, and so there may be zero results, or maybe it thought it was one thing, but didn't really have any ideas past that. So we sort of go by, uh, go through the results list, um, and for anything that was non-null, we populate the UI with that information. All right, so let's go back to our demo and say, here's this amazing smiley face. Uh, let's see if it can identify what it is. And it says it is a pattern. Isn't that that's, cool? That's, that's so true. helpful. That's true. Um, and it was like 60%, 57% of what pattern. What about this one? How about this? This is clearly a triangle. No results. That's no what results. that one that's, is. Yeah, um, that's what I was going to guess. If I draw a more perfect smiley face, maybe that will be it. It is a smile. Hey. hey, this time I drew a smile. Thank you. Thank you very yep. much. So you that's our talk. satisfied the machine. All right. Uh, all right. So that's where they're at. So clearly it couldn't do a lot with that information. Either my drawing is just that bad, or maybe it doesn't have enough data to sort of build on there, or you know, maybe there's too many of these possibilities, and so my smiley face looks like a lot of the things that it just couldn't make up its mind. So the other approach that you can take is to train a model around a more constrained set that is more suited to the kinds of things you're going to be doing. So instead of me drawing anything possible and then asking this model, and I'm not even sure what data it was trained on, to identify what that thing was, I can constrain it and say, well, what if I give you a smaller set of data to infer from, and then a smaller set of inputs on my side, and then see if we can sort of come closer on agreeing what this thing is. So there's this set of data out there produced by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and it's called MNIST because I don't know, that's a re it's hard to pronounce. Um, so they had this huge data set where they asked people to handwrite digits and they just stored that information uh, in various different forms that could then be used to produce models for uh, computer vision analysis, like basically exactly this purpose. So 
we thought, why don't we actually start with MNIST and we will then draw digits into our demo instead of you know, arbitrary smiley faces that aren't very good and see what we can get from that. So you need to get this data, right? It's not there automatically. This is a separate set of data that we need to get onto the device to actually do detection from. So one of the ways you can get those is there's actually a code lab at Google built around the MNIST data called Digit Classifiers. You can go to the code lab site, you can go to Digit Classifier, you can walk through the code lab, um, and you can follow all the steps to train the data. It sends you off to the cloud, and you can you know, get the data from the MNIST site, and you can put it in there, and you can run all the training stuff on it, and then get the model out. Or, and I'm just putting this out there as an option, because I am a software developer, and I am lazy. You can simply go to the code lab and grab the bot model that it already built. If you go to the final step, it actually has the TF Lite model that was produced through all the previous steps in the code lab. So we went there, yep. and we grabbed the model, and we downloaded it, and we put it in the assets folder, and we'll just take that other stuff as read. I think it's really important to be able to train data, but in this case, somebody had already trained it for me, so why don't I just reuse their work? Software is about reuse. How light is our model? Do you remember? Uh, I don't. I it's like five megs. Okay. Yeah. So not too and this was just for 10 digits, but of course it depends on how many samples it was trained on, right? Right. Um, there are some, we were looking at another one, um, uh, another model for doing detection of arbitrary drawings, closer to what we started with here called QuickDraw. QuickDraw, yep. Uh, and that was models that were more along the lines of 70 megs. Like yep. they have vector data that's just massive, massive. Um, all right. So anyway, so how do we get the image label? So we load the model, right? So now we have a model. We're not using the built-in one in ML kit. We need to load the, this uh, TF light model that we um, borrowed. And then we're going to create an interpreter around that. It's not a label or it's an interpreter object, which is a different API uh, for running it on this, this custom model that we have. Uh, and then again, we're going to get the bitmap from the user data. So they draw the face or draw a digit in this case. We're going to get that as a bitmap. We're going to make sure that the input, the user data, is at the same size as the model data. So we're going to ask the model what size bitmap it has and make sure that our data matches that so they can make the right inference there. We're going to process the data as before. We're we're going to sort the results by confidence value uh, to make sure that we know, you know what's the most probable digit, and then we'll show the results as we did before. All right, so uh, the model, we need to extract that as a byte buffer, because that's what we use to create our interpreter. Um, so we call this internal method, load model file, step, step, step. So you can see this. Uh, here's the model file that we downloaded from the code lab. And then at the end, uh, basically, it produces this byte buffer. We return that. We're ready to go. So we create the interpreter here. Uh, we're going to use the NN API. That's an important step. Um, we create the interpreter with the model and these options. We're ready to go. And then we get the information about how big the, uh, the data is that we're comparing to so that we can put the user data bitmap in the same size. Uh, all right, so then we get the bitmap just like we did before. We create the scaled bitmap of the appropriate size, and then we get a byte buffer out of that. So that we're comparing byte buffer on the user side to byte buffer uh, with the model data, and uh, then we run. Um, importantly, this one is a synchronous call, so it's going to block on that run call instead of us getting a callback. We should have uh, coroutine that. Oh, we should. In fact, yeah. we did. Uh, <laughs> we'll show more about that later. Um, all right, so then we have this, uh, this result, which is a list of information basically by the digits 0 through 10, we get back confidence values for each of those numbers. So then we can want to sort by confidence value to see, okay, what is the most probable digit uh, that it is? And then we populate the UI. So let's go back to our demo one more time here. And we'll switch to digit mode here, and we'll clear this, and we'll say, I think this is a... Four. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh nice yeah. two. It's a two. Yep. Uh, in some other cases, it's not as good, but yeah, how about that? That one looks pretty clear. Yep, it's a one. All right. This one, I like this one. If you draw what is clearly a four, then it says that is clearly... Uh, sometimes it just comes out as nine. It's like, yep, I know nine <laughs> when I see them. And it depends on, again, what the input data is. Uh, but anyway, this is looking pretty good. So now, okay, so that was some good front end stuff. 
But we want to be able to share your wonderful drawings with the world, right? Sharing And so this is where we bring in the cloud, right? We got to have this cloud service out there. We got to have a server running and it's going to take this stuff and allow us to share it through a web browser. So let's talk about how we do that. So we're going to start by capturing that bitmap, the drawing stuff that you've seen. We're still going to use the phone for the machine learning and do the predictions, get the predictions out. But then we're going to send the bitmap and the predictions up to a REST service. So we're going to send those up to a server somewhere. And then we want to be able to view those from some other user. And so we need some way to share that data with them. So we're going to take the bitmap and the results from the machine learning and put them onto a message bus. And then we've got our browser app that's just sitting there pulling the message bus, waiting for any drawings to come in. OK, so that's our architecture for how we're going to be able to share those drawings. But um, we need the, the whole point of this, this experiment was, can we use one code base, one project that has both that server side and the Android code that Chet's been showing you all in one project and combine that into a single build and um, make that easy and, and, uh, and then also have a, a common module that we can share code between the client and the server. So I want to walk you through the, the project structure for this. So let's see. Let's go over to IntelliJ, or as you call it, Android Studio. I do. Right? Yeah. Uh, and we've got our build.gradle. This is our, our main root build.gradle, and I'm using the, the Kotlin DSL here. And there's not too much interesting in here. We're just adding uh, a couple things to the dependency class path in our build script, and the, that's the Android Tools Gradle plugin, and then the Kotlin Gradle plugin. And then we've got our project. So we've got our Android project, we've got our common project, and we've got our server project. All here is sub projects. If we go look at the common project, not too much going on in this one. There's just some Kotlin stuff because that's all that we're doing in our Kotlin project. You can go in and explore the Kotlin source code here, just a data.kt with some code that we'll look at in a little bit. But then in our Android uh, build.gradle, you'll see that we have a dependency on the common project. So that's how we share that code in, in there. And then on the server side, you'll see very similarly, we have a dependency on the common project as well. And so then we're able to share that common code across both of those projects and be able to do a single build that can build everything. Um, so nice for testing and, and working on locally, local development, that sort of thing. Okay. So um, one of the examples of code that we're sharing across client and server is something called image result. Image result is a way that we're going to store the byte array, which is the, the bitmap of what the user drew, and then the list of those predictions from the ML service. And so we just have a data class uh, that gets shared across client and server for that. But then to actually send it from the Android phone over to the server, we need to serialize it and, and deserialize it on the other side. So we have some JSON uh, stuff in there to do that for us. Then we need our actual service that we're going to send this to. And so I'm using Micronaut. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, using Kotlin on the server side, you'll see I have a handler for a post to slash show. And it takes a, a HTTP body, which is an image result. And Micronaut's going to deserialize the JSON that comes in, turn it into that image result. And in that case, we're just going to put the data onto that message bus so that then we have another handler for a get to slash events where we're going to pull our bus and see is there any new uh, images that are on the bus and if so take them off and return them in the HTTP response and you'll see that that uh, in that case I just return an image result and that gets serialized into JSON for me. Okay, so that's my server side. And I said I was using Micronaut. It's a great web framework. It's pretty new and supports Kotlin. Uh, it also has a really great quick reload cycle, really nice developer experience. It's got the annotations for defining our request handlers. Um, so a lot of nice stuff in, in Micronaut. Um, definitely have had a good experience with using it with Kotlin. But then on the client side, we need to send the data over. And so I need to create an image result. And so I take my um, bitmap, turn it into a byte array. I take my label annotations that I got from my ML prediction service. 
and I need to get the URL that I want to call, and I've externalized that URL so that we actually can change it based on build configuration, so that when I'm switching between running in the emulator, running on an actual device, um, doing local development against a local server, uh, or when I'm uh, talking to a cloud service, I can switch out that URL easily. So we've parameterized that. And then I'm using an HTTP library on the client called Fuel. So I do a post to my URL. I give it the JSON body of my image result. And in this case, we don't care about the response. So we just print it out. So that's all I had to do on the client to send that data up. So let's take a look at a demo for how that works. And let's see, actually, I want to exit out of there. And here's my application. Let's reload that so we can see a new one. Oh, hey, we're getting your numbers because they're pulling them off the bus. That's nice. great. <laughs> but we can actually see it live here. Let's go to the emulator. And let's see how my drawing is compared to yours. Let's draw a three and hit local ID. And so it is now going to uh, do that ML. Hey, I got 100% on a three. Have you ever seen 100% before? No, when I draw. Dang, I'm good. Good drawler. OK, so we uh, did the ML on the phone, sent the bitmap and the results up to our server running up here. And that just put them onto the bus. And then our polling cycle uh, pulled those off the bus and displayed them. So that is our mullet being able to combine all this stuff together. Um, but of course, we're going to take this a bit further. So let's see. Let's go to the magic cloud. All right. So you remember that part where the shape detection was not really terribly interesting? I thought it was a pattern. Then it was like, well, maybe it's a smile. And uh, so we can do better. You can use ML in the cloud very easily, like not all the cloud stuff that James is talking about or the... The, the full mullet that we'll get to later, um, but instead call very similar APIs to the ones that we're using on device, except they're going to call the cloud instead. So they're calling Firebase in the cloud, and Firebase has much larger models and can spend more time and resources on this thing and hopefully be, uh, return more interesting results. So this is what we did for the on-device uh, labeling. We said, get our vision image, and then we'll get an instance of the on-device image labeler, and then we would process the image and sit there in our callback asynchronously until we get the results. Um, hey, but you, instead, got, you got vowels there. I, I think got, we just forgot to update our code on the I, last I, slide. It's, it's I possible. I need to refactor these slides. Uh, all right. So instead of on-device image label, labeler, we will call cloud image labeler. Um, and that's really all you need to do. So now instead of querying the local device and the local model, uh, then it's going to be calling Firebase APIs up in the cloud. Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer in this asynchronous call, um, but here's what it looks like. So we'll return to our awesome demo. We will clear this. We'll change this to shape detection again. Uh, the so, one that didn't work very well locally, right? That's right. So first I'll start with that awesome circle, and I'll say, what is that? And the local says, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, if I call cloud instead, it says maybe it's a font, maybe it's a circle, hey, maybe it's black and white, which is true, it is, but obviously a lot more information because it have, uh, does have more data and can spend more time sort of analyzing and figuring out what this thing is. If we try this smiley thing again, local inference says, I think it's a pattern. Definitely. And cloud says, I can do better on that. It is black. Uh, <laughs> It is also possibly an emoticon and a facial expression and a smile. And all of those are in the 90s, so it's, it's doing yeah. a lot better. That was magic. Wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Nice. Okay. Now we're going to go full mullet. Yep. The full <laughs> mullet there. Joe Dirt's full mullet. And in this case, what we're going to do is instead of drawing, because it's pretty easy to recognize a drawing, that's just, you know, that's too easy. So let's make it harder. And instead, what we're going to do is we're going to capture sensor data. We're going to use the phone as a magic wand, capture sensor data, and then try to turn that into a drawing that we can recognize. So we're going to send the actual sensor data from the phone up to a REST service. We're going to smooth out that data, try to like, like make it look like an actual drawing. We're going to render it to an image on the server. And then we're going to send that to the Cloud ML API. 
which I think is different than the Firebase one, yep. um, but it's just a general AI model that can recognize like anything. Um, definitely not something you could fit on your phone. And then we're going to take the the bitmap that was created on the server and the results that we got from the cloud ML model, and we're going to put those on the bus, and then we're going to uh, to then pull and get those out to the browser like we saw before. Okay, so we'll see that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about how we actually take the sensor data from the phone. So we're going to use the accelerometer so that we can sense acceleration. And then I think it also augments it with uh, some compass data for rotational. So, um, so I want to pause there. Actually, when, when I first looked at the code that James had put in there for doing all the stuff, and I see that we're using accelerometer, and we're doing all kinds of interpolation on that to try to figure out location, I was like, wait. It's a phone, isn't there location data? And then I realized, no, there's not. Location data is way, way, way too coarse for what we want to do, right? Phone doesn't know the difference between here and here. Phone knows the difference between here and the other end of the theater, right? Depending on you know whether you're using GPS at the time, which is like few meter accuracy, or some of the other uh, location detection things, it's simply not fine enough for doing what we want to do. So the reason that James is using accelerometer is that is really the only piece of data that we have that we can then infer location from. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so it's, it turns out it's tricky because uh, what we're getting out is just acceleration data. So if I was drawing a circle, our X and Y, um, our graphs of what the acceleration look like over time would look something like that. But we have to figure out how to turn those acceleration data points into something that looks like a drawing. And it turns out that's pretty hard and pretty inaccurate. And the reason for that we figured out was like a, they call it a double integration problem but you thought it was a double derivation problem. Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah. yeah, so we have to go from acceleration, which is distance over time squared. Is that right? It's been a while since I took physics. Uh, down to uh, velocity, which is distance over time, and then down to actual position. And at each step through that, we actually lose some accuracy in the data. And so it actually is kind of hard. So that's why we are um, taking the, the accelerometer data and and sending that out to the server so that we can try to deal with how bad that data is. We have a, a shared class that we use between the client and the server called orientation, and that's where we put in our X and Y coordinate data as well as a timestamp, and then you, the code on the right, which you don't really need to read through, but that's how we actually get the accelerometer data out into our orientation um, data, into our list of orientations, and then that list of orientations is what we actually send up to the server. So the way that we send that is very similar to what you saw before. We turn it into our orientations into JSON. But then this time, what we get back from the server is going to be a bitmap and the machine learning readings that we got. And so we want to take that image result that we get back from the server and render that back on the device so that the user can see the predictions on their phone, not just see them in the browser. So that's where we have the response handler there. And then a new controller method slash draw, which takes a post, which takes our list of orientations and returns a responsive string, which is just our serialized image result. And that airdraw.run with the readings is where we do all the crazy stuff. So the crazy stuff. Uh, it's like 10 pages of code, and <laughs> I didn't want to try to put that all on slides, so I summarized it. The first thing we do is something called a Kriging interpolation, which is really just trying to smooth out the data across the time series. So it's taking the, the spikes out of the data, smoothing out, and we do it for both x and y. We do the Kriging interpolation. So this is a linear algebra function. I don't know how it works, um, but I get to just use a library, and it does it for me. Okay, I just give it my data. Uh, and then we need to create our image. So to create our image, we have to do a bunch of like boundary checking stuff. We gotta figure out, we don't wanna stretch the data too far in one direction or another. And so we have to figure out the boundaries. And so that's, there's a bunch of math there. Um, but then we can actually draw our thing into a bitmap. And so I'm actually using the buffered image. I think like you or Roman wrote the buffered image in the AWT. Certainly played with it a lot. Java yeah. AWT. Yep. Give it up for Java 
AWT. Who here has done Java right. AWT? Give right. it up for Java <laughs> AWT. Yeah, so I got to write some AWT code for the first time in a while. That was super fun. Um, and then, uh, oh, then once we get our, our image, our byte, we turn it into a byte array, and then we can send it off to the prediction service, and it's going to try to match that thing to the huge data set uh, that has been um, fed into a model in the cloud ML service. And then we get our annotations back and then send those back to the client. But to be able to run this thing somewhere, uh, there's lots of options to do that. I used a service called Cloud Run, which is backed by an open source project called Knative. And what it is, is serverless for containers. So I need a container, a Docker container, to be able to run my application. So this is my uh, Docker file where I create my container. And you'll see I just run the Gradle build, create a shadow jar, stuff that shadow jar into the container. But then there's one cool thing that because I'm using containers, I actually, because I'm using some AWT libraries, I actually need a native uh, library on the system called font config. Uh, and otherwise I get crazy exceptions. And so because I'm using containers, I'm able to just install that font config library into my container. So that uh, enables me to do, to do what my app needs to do. Um, Okay, so a container, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like a zip file, just kind of like a whole system in a zip file. The, the, uh, it's got the kernel, it's got the system libraries, it's got the JVM, and it's got my application. Everything that the application needs to run goes essentially into a zip file, and that's uh, what I need to run my app on Cloud Run. So I create my container. The way that I do that is I'm using something called Cloud Build, which every time I push to uh, my repo, it's going to kick off off this uh, steps. The first step is to build the Docker container. So that's just running uh, Docker build which runs my Docker file and creates that image, but then I need to push the image to a container registry. I push it to the Google container registry, but you could use uh, Docker Hub or whatever. And then I can do my deployment to Cloud Run, where I just say, essentially, G Cloud beta run, deploy, give it my container image, give it some parameters about where and how to deploy it, and boom, it deploys the app up on the cloud. Okay, so that's how I get my thing running on the cloud, but let's go see a demo of this thing actually working. So we're gonna go back to our web app, and then I'm gonna use my actual phone here, and I'm gonna hit this button, which you can't see, and that's okay. And then I'm gonna just draw around in the air and hit finish, and if everything works correctly, there that I get my line art, my wonderful line art. It is an amazing yeah. line art. Let's yeah. see. Let's try, let's try like a circle, right? And so that's just the accelerometer data being sent to the cloud. And then, oh, I got to hit the finish button, actually. Oh, let's try again. Oh, there we go. Nice, nice Can't photography. you imagine like a version yep. of Pictionary where There's someone's a... drawing with this and then everybody has to guess what it is, including the person that drew it? <laughs> That's, we could invent that. All right. That's, All right. Yeah. We need an app for that. Oh, wait. We have one. <laughs> so definitely an auto part, but it actually did say <laughs> oval 55%. So That's pretty good. That was pretty yeah. good. All right. So in this, this is just a general AI model that we're using that could, if I could draw very complex things, should be able to recognize them. Uh, I think Chet met in the, the quick draw yep. data set would actually fit a lot better with this particular use case because it's trained on data um, very similar to these drawings that we're doing here. Um, but there we go. It's all working. It's sending the accelerometer data up to the cloud, doing all that interpolation and creating the bitmap, sending that off to cloud ML, and then putting that on the bus and then allowing us to render it. And then I do see it here on the phone as well, which you probably can't see. <laughs> okay, so that is our full mullet um, end to end. And now let's talk about some pitfalls we ran into. Some of these things <laughs> were trickier than others. <laughs> it turns out that there's not too many examples out there that use Cl Kotlin for an Android app and a server app all in the same code base. It's uh, not, not much going on in that space yet. Uh, which is why we thought it'd be interesting to do this talk. That's right. Let's figure this stuff out. So uh, the Gradle build plugins um, were a challenge. Uh, the Gradle build plugins seem to assume a structure where I'm not actually like doing server and client in in the same project. And so ideally, I wanted to like apply the Gradle plugin for Android just to the Android sub project, but that doesn't really work. So I actually had to apply the Android plugin um, to the the root project. 
project. Um, so there is some some funkiness there. <clears throat> I got it all working, and you can go check out the the build files to explore how that's set up, and just copy and paste the build files if you want to try to do this because it literally was hours of pain trying to deal with how to figure out build uh, plugin issues. So then uh, JSON was another challenge. So there was um, Micronaut is using Jackson for its JSON stuff. And then on the client side, I was using just the Kotlin serialization JSON stuff. And it turns out those two JSON libraries actually do things differently. Um, you know, who knew? I thought JSON was kind of universal. But <laughs> no, it turns out there are uh, differences in how JSON is handled between different libraries. I'd say. Yeah, step one in serialization. Make sure you use the same thing on both ends. <laughs> That's right. But, yeah. yeah, that's that's helpful. Um, so as an example, uh, what I what I found was I think that one of the JSON libraries was encoding my bitmap as a base sixty four string, and one of them was actually encoding my bitmap, essentially my byte array, as an array of of integers. Huh. And um, so they they didn't like that. They didn't like to <laughs> yeah. And so that was fun. Um, so Jason, Jason, getting that Jason layer correct was was a little bit of a challenge. Okay, then uh, externalizing the URL. So I really wanted to be able to change the URL based on my build config. It wasn't too bad uh, to do this. I, I should actually show this part because um, it's kind of interesting and, and I think useful if you're trying to do this sort of thing. If we go look at our Android build file, what we will see in here is I read a parameter um, from this parameter just comes in from my build config. I can set it. I don't know if you have it set in gradle.properties. Oh, you do. There it is, set in, in gradle.properties, or you can pass it in as a command line parameter. Um, but what we do is we read that draw URL, and then I do need to figure out um, for an Android manifest setting uh, <laughs> if we're going to allow uh, the use of, of clear text traffic or not. And so I see it does. Start with HTTPS, right? Uh, then I um, update my manifest placeholders and put that uses clear text traffic because when I'm doing local development, I don't want to have to set up HTTPS and all that kind of stuff locally. And so, so that's why we need really for local development need to be able to enable clear clear text traffic. Okay, but then I set a res value of uh, name draw URL, which is a string, to the URL that came in as a parameter. Um, okay, so uh, that allows me to then parameterize that draw URL, which gets set as a resource value. And you may have remembered seeing it, but I'll show you in the code over here where we actually can then read out that resource value to get the URL. Um, right, oh, there it is. Oh, that was fancy. Like yeah. it just like put in the replacement for me. And then I clicked IDEs. on it. It showed me the Am I right? magic. Yeah. Yeah. Magic. I don't think IntelliJ does that. That's like an Android Studio magic. Nor does thing. VI. <laughs> Nor does VI. Okay, so then I do resources.getString with my resource string draw URL, right? And that's how I can get my parameterized URL um, back out. So it wasn't too hard to figure out how to do that. Um, and it is kind of cool that I can like substitute values in. If we look at the Android manifest.xml, um, let's see. I, I think I finished that to do. Why didn't I delete my to do? Uh, so here's where we actually substitute in that um, that value, which came from, if we look back in our, nope, not the server build, Gradle over on this one. When we do this manifest placeholders, that allows us then to substitute that value in here in the, the manifest file. Um, so that's how we link those two together. OK, so that was the um, challenge around externalizing the URL. Again, possible, um, possible, and not too hard on that one, but some challenges. Math is hard. Math is hard. Um, <laughs> math is hard. Uh, it turns out that taking that accelerometer data and turning it into a drawing was trickier than I thought it would be. Uh, one of the challenges was actually around um, the way that the data uh, works when you cross over. It's it's giving you. Um, uh, what's the circumference of a circle? Uh, it's giving you the data, data in radians. It's like 
pi r squared radians, yeah. negative pi r squared radians to pi r squared radians or something like that. My math is old. Um, but we could go look at the code and see. But essentially, there's a point where you can actually, your data can cross over the line between the negative and the positive. Uh, and um, on the on the back side, not on the zero side, and it, and when you do that, you need to actually account for that. And I have a bug currently in the app, and the reason why I faced this direction was to avoid hitting the line, which is right here. <laughs> um, so uh, so, anyways, math is hard. Uh, it's hard to to do these conversions from three um, D worlds to two D spaces and stuff, especially when you're just working with acceleration instead of just the location that we actually. Wanted. That's right. <laughs> uh, ML is hard. Um, so ideally, one of, one of the things that we want to do for this talk is to actually work on training the data as well. There is this QuickDraw database uh, that we want to check out that has exactly what we want, which is basically you know hand drawings of various objects, nicely labeled. But it's such a huge data set that it's kind of um, not obvious how to deal with that in a way where we can sort of get this nice condensed model uh, down onto the device. So figuring out you know exactly. Uh, what we have to play with, how to train this stuff for the built-in stuff, like what will it detect? Um, it seems to be very picky about the, the colors that we use and like white on black seem to work better for some of the uh, data results than others. Um, the, the width of the stroke needed to sort of match whatever the, the input width was for the model. So there are various things which um, from the outside, and I'm very much on the outside for ML, are sort of a black box. So kind of kicking the box uh, a bunch to, to figure out what would work best was, was the approach. Well, and with the accelerometer data, one of the things that we could do with the quick draw data set, because it's in vector form, is we don't have to convert it to an image to do the analysis against the image recognition ML service. We could just have a model that is just the vector data and take our sensor data and compare it to, to that. So that would be one way to improve it, but yeah, it's hard. Uh, async is hard. Um, so you get ready to process the results and you call this thing and for the on device detection it's going to take, I don't know, like 20 to 50 milliseconds to come back. Like pretty fast, but in UI terms, like, well, the user is just kind of looking at a blank screen, right? Or in the cloud, it's going to take maybe a second or two to actually come back. So is your application frozen? Is it thinking about it? Does it not have any results? And so just dealing the normal software thing of like, well, when something can't happen immediately, then what do you do to let the user know that, you know, everything's okay and you're going to come back with the information uh, correctly? On the other hand, um, sync is also hard. Uh, so I had written the code for the interpreter. Remember, there were two approaches that we were using. There was the labeler, at least for the on-device uh, detection. There was the labeler, which did the um, process results, and it gave you back this callback, and then you basically come back to the callback eventually, and then go on from there. Uh, but then there was the interpreter that I created for uh, the model, the, the custom digit model that we were using. And that one was synchronous, which is great, right? I just I call this thing, and then I'm immediately uh, sitting there with the results, and then I populate the UI. And then as a UI programmer, eventually I realized, wait, 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 wait. I was just making like a local network call and waiting for it. And it turns out that takes like 20 to 40 milliseconds just for that little digit processing, which means I froze the UI for like two to three frames just sitting there waiting for the results. Um, so and what Android you, like tells you, it like com complains yeah, yeah, yeah. to you, it says yeah. you're wrong, stop yeah. this. Strict mode warnings, yeah. the whole deal, log yeah. cat, everybody's screaming at you in yeah. all caps, don't do this thing. So eventually, uh, I took the approach that we should take, especially if you're using Kotlin, coroutines exist to solve problems like this, right? So instead of, so I have this method called check digit, and that's where this stuff would all happen, and then in check digit, it gets the bitmaps, it calls the processing. Um, well, here, we set up the main, all the stuff on the main thread uh, in, the, in the suspend function, and then we dispatch out to um, the I.O. Uh, thread or the, the pool of threads that are being used for I.O. instead. We run that over there, and then when that's done, uh, of course, our, our coroutine has been paused in the meantime, and we've gone back. The UI is now responsive um, because that's the magic of coroutines. But then when this other thing is done, then our coroutine gets back in action, interprets the results, populates the UI, and the right thing happens. I love that you get to suspend the fun. That's yeah, <laughs> just such great keywords. I feel like that just describes my life. Uh, all right, so I think for future... 
for future stuff, like we want to keep hacking on this thing. Um, I think we probably have some more places that we should add some coroutines to, uh, to reduce some synchronicity. Uh, issues. I want to check out the quick draw stuff. I think that it is worth um, figuring out how to actually train data, whether it's our own data. Like we could certainly create a bunch of data, you know, draw a bunch of cats. Um, and, you know, I think as long as you have like 100 imagers or something, you can start uh, having your own model or use standard models out there um, and see where that goes. Yeah. And then I also want to add Kotlin JS, see if we can create a little yep. web app. I, I think I'm just using like JavaScript right now on the web app. It'd be nice to convert that to Kotlin JS. Kotlin, Kotlin everywhere. Fun. Kotlin, uh, Kotlin everywhere. And otherwise, that is it. So the code is all up on uh, GitHub. Wow, you're sharing that? Okay. Right. I didn't think we were ready for that. Well, it is in a branch. We just won't tell them the branch <laughs> name. <laughs> all right. It is. It is not a finished project, but you can see at least see the um, actual code that we were putting on slides to see how the, some of the stuff was done. Yep. So. And if you want to do a multi-project like this, then you can take our build files and not have to figure all that out on your own. Yep. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Hopefully that was useful. Thanks.